My name is Andrew Tian. I'm Vice President for Global Government Affairs at John Wiley & Sons. And as you all know, our industry uh, from publishers all across the spectrum to learned and professional and scholar societies on a uh, daily basis are facing many different kinds of disruption. Technology, which is harder to predict. Policy, which we used to be able to predict. Um, and policy in particular is having a significant impact on our business and affecting every aspect of what we're doing. And so today, we're going to take a deeper dive and look at what's happening in the UK and Europe, and in particular, the implications that they have for us here, but also globally. I think a common theme is that society publishers need to engage and need to act. And we hope to give you today not only some intelligence uh, for you to take back to your organizations, but some practical recommendations and actions that you can take. We are going to do this in a panel slash talk show style. Um, first, we'll have Robert Kiley from Welcome Trust provide an overview on their new OA requirements um, developed in partnership with publishers and the broader community, and talk also about their open research strategy uh, from preprints to infrastructure and their plan and agenda more broadly. Uh, Alex Hardy from Harvard Ole and Lewis will talk about everyone's favorite UK topic, Brexit, <laughs> and uh, what that means in a range of operational and policy areas for society publishers. And I will be talking about the open science active agenda in Brussels and uh, what it means for all of us and, and what we need to do about it. And we will take questions after um, all the speakers. So please, in particular, for I think the many questions you'll have for Robert and for Alex, do take detailed notes and we'll reconvene afterward. So let me introduce our panelists. We have some uh, esteemed experts uh, for you today. So I think many of you know Robert Kiley, who is head of digital services at Welcome Trust and currently acting as open research development lead uh, at the organization. So that means he's responsible for developing a new open research strategy for the Welcome Trust, uh, no small task. And over the past decade, Robert has played a leading role in the implementation of the Trust's open access policy and overseeing the development of Europe's PubMed Central repository. He also acts as the trust's point of contact for eLife, the open access journal launched in 2012 with the support of Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Max Planck Society, and of course the Wellcome Trust. And he'll uh, share more about what he's been doing in terms of their open publishing platform, uh, Welcome Open Research. Away from OA-related activities, Robert is also responsible for developing the infrastructure that supports Welcome's library strategy to provide free online and universal access to the library's unique and important collections. He's a published author of a variety of titles, a qualified librarian, and an associate member of SILIP, and sits on the ORCID board. Alex Hardy is a senior associate at Harbottle & Lewis, She's worked in the publishing industry, and I think with many of us, um, as an editor and an in-house lawyer uh, before she joined Harbottle Lewis's technology, media, and entertainment group. And she now works with publishers, authors, agents, retailers, and publishing technology providers on cutting-edge legal and commercial issues. Uh, and Brexit certainly is at the uh, forefront among these. She's also a publishing industry specialist for Coppinger and Scone James on copyright, and as a member of the UK Publisher Association's Law Group and ALPSB's Copyright Subcommittee. Uh, and finally, I guess I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, uh, lead Wiley's Global Government Affairs uh, Group, and am the chair of the Government Affairs Committee for ALPSB. 
So with that, let me welcome uh, Robert. Please join me in welcoming Robert to the stage. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good morning, and thanks, thanks for, uh, for coming along this morning. I think compared with what's got to follow, trying to talk about Brexit, I've got a really easy job. I'm just going <laughs> to what I'm just going to describe what what Welcome has been up to, what we're doing, and so on. So, um, <clears throat> hope we talk about 15 or 20 minutes, then give them plenty of time for questions at the at the end of the session. So, I'm going to um, I'm going to split this into four nice discrete uh, areas. I'm going to talk first of all about the work I'm leading on just generally about developing an open research strategy for the trust and what we're, what we're hoping to do. I'm then going to talk very specifically about um, some requirements, some publisher requirements we, we announced last week and, and why we've done that and what it, what it means for publishers and, and the consequences of, of, that, of that policy. I'm going to talk about a new initiative we've launched uh, in collaboration with the Faculty of 1000, which is going to welcome open research and talk a little bit about, about preprints and our support for this sort of growing interest in, in, in preprints. So I'm going to start just generally on the, the high level bit. So I've been in the library for, for many years and I've been currently, I'm currently seconded to try and develop a, a strategy uh, for the trust around, around open research. So really what are the opportunities, what could Welcome do to try and move the needle uh, in this space? Uh, it's a, it's a nine-month project. There's no guarantee uh, uh, of the outcome. Maybe we're just carrying as we are. Maybe we'll uh, put further investment in there. That is that is all to be determined. But what I'm trying to do is work out really the, the areas where I think uh, Welcome could make a difference and then present that as some sort of prioritised uh, and costed roadmap. And the ambition is really to ensure that the outputs of research, and for that we really mean articles, uh, data and code. How do they? How can we make sure that they are? They comply with the, the fair principles around research being findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. And our deadline is to get this all done, uh, and it goes to our board of governors, which are the the governance body at the Welcome, uh, for a decision. And I think at its high level, we have a sort of vision that if you make all these research outputs open, they can have a transformative effect on. Improving, improving health, and there are sort of—it's uh, always like difficult to, you know, you, what you really need are some absolutely compelling examples as to how openness does benefit. And there's a few examples here. So we genuinely believe that it does accelerate, uh, it accelerate discovery and its application to healthcare. And there was a really nice piece uh, published in Nature Comms uh, earlier in the summer, where. Data, this was uh, neurological images data, which were all open and were just out there. Somebody computationally mined all that and were able to identify um, early triggers of, of Alzheimer's disease. So again, it wasn't, wasn't like new stuff they had to do. It was just analysis of existing content. We're also a funder which spends, we have an ambition to, to spend a, over, over five billion pounds over the next five years. We want to maximize return on that investment. Um, and the Human Genome Project is still probably one of the best examples, and there's been lots of studies, but the key one everyone quotes, including me, is this notion that you spend a dollar and you get about $141 return, so great return on investment. And obviously there's a huge issue around at the moment about reproducibility, um, so ensuring that data and the code is out there enables others to reproduce and also make sure we don't, we don't waste time and resource doing things which already other people have done and proven to be ineffective. That's all very well. There's a huge number of challenges uh, to actually realize this. There's stuff around infrastructure. Though in the field of genomics, there's well-established repositories where data can be uh, deposited and reused. In other areas, that, that is not the case. Um, a whole business around incentives. Um, for many people, the idea of, of, of sharing data is sort of, in principle, supportive, but they can see many downsides. It's not for, for some, they think it's treated like a second-class research object. They don't get the kudos for it. They don't get the reward. And worse still, other people may be able to take their data and analyze the data before they've had time to. They get publications, and they're the ones who get kudos. So there's a whole issue around incentives and how, we, how do we address that. Um, skills and capacity. It's, again, very easy to say you must share your data, 
but to make it usable you have to obviously annotate it and make sure it is in a way which can be shared maybe the skills aren't there for everyone to, to do that um, there's a particular issue around uh, data sharing in the low middle income countries where potentially they may not then benefit from the outputs of sharing their results a classic case being all the influenza research they shared and then they weren't able to benefit from the vaccines which were developed and a whole raft of other issues. So there's a, a lot of challenges out there. So we're trying to start simple. We're trying to work out currently what are our, what are our attitudes and practices at Welcome. We're mapping what we currently spend on, on this sort of on, in this space, doing a number of sort of landscaping reviews, uh, and taking forward a, a number of projects which are which I'll talk about there. So it's really just trying to work out what the issues are, and then we'll start recommending some. Uh, possible solutions. So that's a quick overview of what we're doing on the, the broader open research agenda. I'm going to change tack and move, move uh, much into much more specifics and talk first about uh, some publisher requirements. And before I start, I should say um, Welcome has had a series of requirements in place uh, since 2005. Once we first announced our open access policy, we had a, a requirement around deposition in PubMed Central, um, uh, freely available at the time of publication, that type of thing. Over the years, they have, we, we, we've strengthened them. I believe in 2013, we introduced a requirement that when we pay an article processing charge, the article must be licensed under a CCB, CC by license. Um, so we've gradually sort of made them more specific and we felt it was probably time to just to, uh, reaffirm and make explicit what it is we require when an APC is paid. And really the objectives here are uh, really to reduce the number of articles where funding is paid and we don't believe we got the service we, we thought we were paying for. As I've mentioned, we want to clarify what we what we ask for. And I suppose really the, the, the holy grail here is to try and simplify the whole process, um, particularly for institutions, uh, but also for funders and, and, and publishers. And what I didn't want to do, uh, and this slide contradicts this, I didn't want us to do a lot of pu publisher bashing here. This is, we understand it's a very complex, uh, organ uh, complex set of relationships. But I did just want to highlight that the problems which we have been talking about for many years, and we publish and we share our data and, and so on, they do persist. And I did on this first example try to redact the journal name, but apologies if you can already work out what it is. But this is on the left-hand side here, this direct acting antiviral. is an example where an article has been paid. Um, the bits in yellow you probably can't see clearly says it's an open access article, and it's published under Creative Commons attribution license. But on this particular publisher website, you cannot see this article unless you've got a subscription. And there's lots of stuff around all rights reserved, and it's got a watermark on it. You can't use this, even though it's a CC by article. So, you know, how difficult is this, guys? You've, you've taken the money, you've published it open access, and you've put it behind a paywall. Um, it's not acceptable. Uh, another example of, a, of an article where the license on the publisher site is at odds with the license in PubMed Central. The license in PubMed Central in this example is much more restrictive. So if a license changes, um, we expect those changes to be reflected in our version. So really what we try to identify are sort of three areas we expect publishers to, uh, to, to work on. Uh, one is around deposit. So it's, again, it's this requirement to deposit in PubMed Central at time of publication in XML and, and, and PDF. Um, and where publishers use Crossmark, we encourage them to include Crossmark data in their submissions. So that's around deposit. In terms of licenses, and again, the requirement that articles should be made available under, under a CC BY license, and that license statement should be, should be readable, uh, both by humans and, and, and machines. And then the third one, uh, which really came from the institutions we spoke to around um, invoicing. And um, we spoke to a number of institutions who, who wondered how they are expected to pay an invoice if the only information it has on it is an internal manuscript ID. Uh, so again, we, we, we initially started off asking for a lot more. We said it thought it'd be useful to have the title, it'd be useful to have the DOI, the funder name. A number of publishers who we collaborated with on this said 
that's too difficult at this stage. And we, we recognize that, so we sort of rode back, and we now simply say it's got to include the title of the article, but we do set some sort of uh, aspiration that in the future, uh, these invoices will become richer in terms of metadata, so the institutions know what they're paying for. And the other thing we, we thought would be helpful was just to get absolutely clear what the refund policy, what the refund policies are. So we don't say anything about what they should say, just simply a requirement that a publisher should have a publicly accessible refund policy. So they're the, they're the, the requirements in a nutshell. Uh, we've asked, the good thing about welcome authors is that um, though they obviously are very productive, they publish a lot of stuff, um, they tend to publish in a relatively small number of, with publishers. Um, in fact, 85% of our, uh, where research is published is in 15, with 15 publishers. And to get to 95%, you only have to go to 35 publishers. So you can get, we can reach out an awful lot of publishers to, um, to get a message across, uh, to which we've done. Um, really what we're asking for is by the middle of December, publishers to assert that they can meet those requirements. We will then publish like a, effectively a whitelist of those publishers which have a compliant policy. And then it will come into effect from uh, the 1st of April, 2017. So if a publisher is not on that list and an author still publishes with that publisher and that publisher charges an APC, then they won't be able to use, the institution won't be able to use our funds to cover that article process and charge. Um, I've already mentioned this, but we've contacted uh, a number of publishers. Uh, we're talking to institutions to make them aware of it. And we're really hoping to work, uh, obviously, with publishers, but also with, with, with trade bodies. And we've had some dialogue already with PA and ALPSP. And one of the things I think trade bodies could really help us with is developing some sort of good practice guidelines around what, a, what an invoice should, should contain, and also perhaps what a model refund policy might include. Obviously, that would be up to individual publishers to decide how they wanted to, to follow that or not. But I think that could be some real useful role the, um, the trade bodies could, could play. So that's our publisher requirements. I now want to talk about two specific things. Uh, next one is Welcome Open Research, which is this new publishing platform we announced um, early this summer. It's a platform we're developing in collaboration with uh, F1000 Research. And it's a... Uh, it's a platform, um, it's only available to welcome funded researchers. It's, you know, it's got to be in that exclusive club. And, but it's where they can publish any results they think uh, worthy of sharing. And the objectives around this is, is to improve how research is communicated and around making the whole process faster and more transparent. And because you have to uh, deposit data with, with research papers, trying to make the whole thing more, more reproducible. And I should say that this is really is a, a one of a, a series of initiatives we are doing. Andrew mentioned uh, eLife, which we've been supporting for five or six years, and we've just announced further funding for, for a further five years. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, preprints. And obviously, we're still continuing to support the full range of open access publishers, including full open access and, and hybrid publishing. So as a whole, so this welcome open research should be seen in the, in the round. And what we really see the benefits uh, benefits of this new platform are around these key areas. And I don't know, hopefully most of you are at the first session where Philippa was talking about some of the current problems. Well, this may not be the panacea for all societies, ills and evils, but, but this can certainly address some of those issues. Articles are published fast. So there is on submission, the platform would undertake a series of what we call sort of hygiene checks. So we make sure ethical statements are there, we'll make sure um, the data, we'll make sure the content's not plagiarized, we'll make sure the data is associated with it, is accessible and so forth. But once those, those sort of checks have been done, the article is published, gets a DOI, it gets a citation, and at that point, peer review starts. Um, we hope it's gonna be completely inclusive. This is a place where you can publish, as I said, all your research outputs, so that may be a null or negative study, it could be a case report, it could be a data set, it could be a protocol, it could be a research article. It can publish all your outputs here. Obviously, it fulfills all our open access and data sharing requirements. It touches reproducibility issues. And it's completely transparent. The peer review process is, is, is transparent. So um, 
your article gets appeared, you select peer reviews, peer reviewers, their, their comments are made public, and there's back and forth. And one of the nice things about it is this ability to have sort of dynamic updates. So a version one comes out, reviewers comment on it. Version two then addresses those comments, and that's available. But if at downstream, you know, that you realize that there is some data which was wrong, you want to correct it, you just produce version three or version four, wherever you've got to. So it, it's always up to date. And when you land on an article, even if you get, even if the link takes you to version one, as it were, the site is clever enough to know that actually this has been updated and will take you to, to version four. You can still see all the previous versions, but it, by default, it will take you to the most, most current ones. And one thing we've done on this one is to try and simplify the process. We've said we'll pay ABC directly. What does success look like for us? We'll get some content. Our researchers will, will publish on this platform. Uh, and I think it'd be good to get a range of researchers from um, the very well established, but also really early career, public early career researchers who may struggle to get a, 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 you know, a list of articles for their, for their CV. Um, I've already mentioned that we want to encourage a range of research outputs, so we we'll encourage these sort of outputs. Um, we hope other funders will uh, establish their own platforms, and publishers may consider adopting some of the practices here. One other thing I forgot on that list is obviously we want this content to be well used, so we're hoping that, that the articles, to, articles up there will be well cited and well read and so forth. And then finally, I just want to just touch on preprints as the, the, the one other area we're, we're looking at. So there's really is a, uh, you know, the preprints have been around in the, as we know, in the, in the, in the physical sciences, in, in, our, in physics and so forth, for uh, 1990, what's that, 25, 26 years or so. Um, but in the life sciences, haven't never really taken off. I, in Nature Publishing Group did something called Nature Precedings a few years ago. Uh, and then that sort of withered and died in about 2012. But there's been this outfit um, led by uh, Dr. Ron Vale, um, Asat Bio, which is really trying to sort of generate interest in, in preprints. Really as a, as a fast way in which you can disseminate your research outputs, uh, you can get priority, you know, they're time stamped. Also an opportunity to get feedback and then downstream, you can then send them for consideration in a formal uh, peer review journal. So obviously for this to happen, again, it's all down to incentives again. Uh, things like fund funders have to sort of change the processes so that researchers can cite uh, preprints. So at the moment, uh, because there's been no interest, our sort of application form has a sort of a, a fairly standard box that says, you know, tell us about your peer reviewed research outputs. And, and that wasn't done with any sort of malice or, or really any forethought, I suspect. It's just that's what we've always been expected. So we need to change that word in to make it clear that people can also cite uh, preprints, so stuff which hasn't gone through <coughs> formal peer review. And we also need to do that at, at the end of grant process. But equally, we also need to develop guidance for our reviewers who, when they're you know, presented with a list of five or so, for some grants, we ask researchers to like, list your 10 most important papers. And we expect the researcher, you know, the reviewers, to review, read that, that stuff. If some of the articles they're citing are preprints, then we need to give some guidance on the fact that you know, this may require a bit more work on your part because no one has actually checked to see whether the conclusions they've drawn are borne out by the data they've presented. So it is a bit more work, and we need to work, work through that. And then finally, we're working very closely with ASAP Bio and a whole uh, collaboration of funders um, to see if there's some way which the funding community together can actually develop infrastructure to make um, to make this sort of preprint to make preprints as sort of universally accepted as you know as, as PubMed and as PubMed Central. So we're working to see uh, how we can build infrastructure. Obviously, we need to change the culture. There's no point in having a fantastic set of infrastructure if no one's depositing. And the number of articles still is, is, ti is pretty tiny. I think BioArchive have got a total of about five or 6,000 preprints, and they've been going about two or three years. There has been a, an increase, but the number's still relatively small. And if you consider that PubMed indexes about 1.1 million articles a year, the preprints are a tiny, tiny percentage of that. So we need to obviously change the culture, which I believe is what funders can do,
by encouraging researchers to cite preprint. And what publishers are also doing by, by many of them are making it absolutely clear that publication on a preprint server does not constitute prior publication. Not all publishers have said that, but a great many have, including you know, very big and well-established publishers such as Nature, Science, and, and journals like that. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there, which I think I've run out of time anyway. So um, I'll hand over to Alex, and then we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Well, I've actually been wondering whether um, shifting sands is quite the right metaphor for a talk about Brexit. Um, I'm thinking uh, the more appropriate metaphor might be one of rugs being pulled out from under feet um, rather than shifting sands beneath our feet because I know that uh, a lot of companies and a lot of individuals were surprised by the referendum results back in June. But whatever the appropriate metaphor, Brexit has already had an impact on business and it will continue to do so for obviously years to come. So as a publishing lawyer, um, I'm advising people across the industry, um, publishers and authors and retailers and publishing technology companies, um, and both in the trade and academic sectors. So in this presentation, I'll begin by discussing briefly the legal status of the referendum result, and then go on to discuss four key areas of law relevant to the publishing industry as a whole and how Brexit has and may continue to impact on these areas. And they are intellectual property law, contract law, data protection and employment law. And I'm also, as part of that, going to be sharing some of the strategic thinking we've been doing with our clients in these areas to help them get prepared for what is a very uncertain future. So, as we are told regularly, Brexit means Brexit. All clear. Um, what does this mean? Well, we were asked on the 23rd of June, should the UK remain a member of the European Union? And the answer was, of course, no. And Britain's exit from the Union, or Brexit, was confirmed. Of course, what the referendum didn't ask was how or when the UK should leave the EU, nor what kind of relationship the UK should continue to have with the EU thereafter. And of course, nearly three months on, we still don't have answers to these questions. And that's because the referendum in itself doesn't have a legal effect. A further step is required to actually initiate the UK's departure. And this, of course, is Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. This is, requires the UK to give formal notification to the EU or of its withdrawal. And then it describes the process for negotiation of the terms of that withdrawal. It also puts a time frame on this process of two years. This Article 50 has never been invoked before, and this, of course, leads to further uncertainty about the precise mechanics of this process. Consequently, the sands just keep shifting. And whilst the UK government is keen to reassure us all that it's business as usual, many people in this room have already experienced that that is not quite the case. Some examples um, is obviously currency fluctuations. A number of businesses have already felt the effects of Brexit on their bottom line. Now, this has been a potential boon for export sales and other areas, but concerning for areas such as manufacturing and material costs. And until the UK formally leaves the EU, its trade arrangements remain in place, existing trade arrangements. But we've already read a commentary and heard anecdotally that some trading relationships have cooled, um, whether for political or practical reasons. And this is extended not just to trading relationships, but all kinds of cross-border initiatives. Um, we've all read reports about a number of UK researchers who feel they have been excluded from Horizon 2020 applications uh, now because the uncertainty about the UK's participation in that program in future is at stake. And before the referendum, a number of Remain campaigners warned that a vote for Brexit would mean that business in the UK would grind to a halt uh, because of the climate of instability. Thankfully, that hasn't come to pass, um, but anecdotally, a number of my colleagues and I have seen 
uh, a number of contracts, some investments, some partnerships, which have been cancelled or postponed since the referendum. And in a number of these cases, it would seem that Brexit is not so much the cause of um, things, uh, of these issues, but it's more of an opportunity for parties to hold off on deals or arrangements that they were not entirely committed to in the first place. Of course, on the grander political scale, the last-minute postponement of the Hinkley nuclear power plant deal um, is an example of this. And of course, we had news this morning that that's now going ahead on varied terms. And of course, it's certainly not business as usual for anyone working in government affairs or policy. Um, business and trade organisations are facing the challenge of maintaining influence in Europe, but also refocusing uh, their efforts and resources on government and industry bodies here in the UK, perhaps in a way they hadn't done so previously. Um, for example, the Publishers Association just yesterday announced their Brexit manifesto, which indicates that there'll be um, the key areas that they'll be asking the UK government to take action on, and those are, of course, uh, copyright research funding and the issue around migration of skilled workers. And though our laws remain unaffected for now, providing or receiving legal advice in this environment is very challenging. Uh, departure from the union could still mean that the UK is within the European economic area or free trade area, uh, and, that's, and that because of that, certain EU laws will remain in effect. But from what the UK government has said so far, it seems possible that a more bespoke arrangement might be on the cards. So, how can we prepare for a new legal framework when we don't even know what it is yet? This is what my colleagues and I are talking to a lot of our clients about at the moment, and no doubt you're having similar conversations within your own organisations. So I'm just going to share with you some of the latest insights and ideas from those conversations as they relate to these key areas of law. If you can see them, I appreciate it's a bit favored, uh, um, faded, but it's uh, intellectual property rights, contracts, data protection and employment law. So starting with intellectual property rights and principally copyright. Now, copyright law in the UK is mainly derived from national laws and international treaties. So a departure from the EU at present would leave UK copyright law as it is largely unaffected. But having said that, uh, the EU has, uh, is in the process and has been in the process for some time of modernising and harmonising copyright law throughout member states, largely through its digital single market initiative. And just yesterday, while we were all sitting in the other room over there, it published its latest uh, proposed new directive. And this digital single market will harmonise copyright with the intention of allowing consumers and users of copyright greater access across the European borders. Uh, they can access their video on demand content, for example, um, from uh, any place in Europe watching um, the BBC uh, wonderful products they, and uh, the, um, the football games uh, broadcast all around Europe. Uh, there was a big um, analysis of the availability of uh, football games in the various impact statements around this. Um, the UK has, of course, been a key stakeholder in this process to date, but the extent of its influence over the next part of this uh, is now quite uncertain following the referendum. The UK Intellectual Property Office has said it will continue to participate in the shaping of the digital single market laws and encourages UK rights holders to do the same. However, there is a risk that the UK loses its influence over this process now. And if the UK chooses to leave the EU entirely, the, U the EU then loses a major contributor of content to this digital marketplace. So the directive is now being tabled before Parliament. So it's possible we can expect 12 to 18 months, uh, potentially, of further consultation before it's adopted. Uh, and unlike a, a European regulation, a directive is not automatically law in member states. They are required to adopt that. And there's often a one or up to two year period to enable that adoption time. So it is possible that the UK will leave the EU at some point during this process. 
But um, if this does not, um, if this happens, there is an opportunity here for the UK to reflect on its own copyright agenda independent of these European reforms. And that would give us greater flexibility to sort of harmonise from the sidelines potentially uh, and pick and choose those elements that might be more appropriate for the um, for UK rights holders and users' needs. But until we know what form Brexit will take, UK rights holders, um, such as publishers, uh, should continue to stay engaged with and influence the shaping of this digital single market development and stay engaged in this process while they still can. Trademarks um, is an area that is much more um, harmonised across the uh, European Union. And, for example, at present, you can register for a trademark in the UK and in each individual member state. Or you can register for a single trademark that will protect your uh, mark uh, throughout the European Union. Now, many of you will have, have such registrations for your business and trading names and for your publications and products. If the UK were to leave the EU entirely, uh, the UK would no longer be within the scope of a, a European trademark registration. So potentially, an additional registration would be required to ensure protection of the mark in the UK. Um, this is potentially an expensive exercise for many trademark owners. And it also then leaves questions around the use and enforcement of marks in two separate territories. Um, colleagues of mine are part of a working group of trademark lawyers who are devising mechanisms that might allow trademark owners to convert their rights uh, to enable pro on continual protection in both the EU and the UK. In the meantime, we're helping our clients to review their portfolio of marks and see which might be affected and what kind of budget they should be preparing for in the event that two separate registrations are required. If you're making new registrations, it might be prudent to make two at the outset to minimise the Brexit risk, although, of course, this is an issue of costs. Commercial contracts are less heavily regulated than other areas of law, such as consumer contracts, which I'll come on to mention. So the Brexit effect is potentially minimised in this area. Of course, the terms of commercial contracts could be affected significantly by UK departure from Europe. So uh, one obvious example is the territorial scope of a contract. Generally, and particularly in publishing licences, the grant of a licence is normally for specifically named territories rather than, for example, a licence to use a work in the European Union. But I have seen examples of this, and um, I know a number of clients are now reviewing their standard contracts to check for this kind of issue in the event that the European Union no longer means what they thought it did. The rules on the governing law of a contract and jurisdiction of contractual disputes um, are fairly complex, but uh, suffice to say the guidance we've had to date and the opinions indicate that European courts are likely to respect the choice of English law made by parties in a commercial contract. However, there is still some uncertainty about how this will be maintained in future, and I know a number of um, contractual parties who are now looking at arbitration and alternative dispute resolution as a means to resolve contractual disputes. So arbitration is a form of private dispute re resolution which is enforceable in any country which has signed the New York Convention, and this convention predates the European Union. So it's likely that arbitration and other forms of um, ADR, alternative dispute resolution, are going to become increasingly popular for any UK entity entering into cross-border agreements or foreign entities entering into contracts within the UK in the coming years. And this is certainly an area that we'll be advising on increasingly. We've also been asked whether Brexit and the referendum result is a force majeure event, something that would allow a party to cancel or postpone its obligations under a contract. The answer for most commercial contracts is likely to be no, because the effects to date have not seemed so great that they've disrupted business completely. Um, and so much that the contract is um, essentially frustrated and can't be performed. But contracts might be getting more expensive to perform, um, so parties who might be particularly affected by currency fluctuations or changing trade conditions should be looking at their contracts now with a view to renegotiation, of particularly around prices and service performance levels. 
when we're negotiating contracts for our clients now, we are considering how prices may fluctuate, uh, trade may be inhibited, and whether key personnel may not be available to perform the services under the contract because of potential changes to the movement of people in the EU. Um, we're building in options to either review or terminate in those certain circumstances where they really go to the heart of the performance of the contract. Consumer contracts, as I mentioned, um, are heavily shaped by EU law, and the UK government will be making decisions as to whether to adopt or adapt the European laws in the event that we, um, depending on the outcome of the UK's departure. These laws, um, particularly relating to e-commerce, uh, went through significant amendment in the last few years. So presumably there is potential for the UK government to repeal or adapt some of those laws which businesses have found particularly onerous or unfavourable. However, of course, I doubt this is going to be a key priori priority area for the government, and I would expect that any campaign for a reduction or weakening of consumer rights uh, is unlikely to be politically popular. So for the moment, the UK must comply with all EU consumer laws, and even after Brexit, in whichever form that it takes, compliance to some extent will be required in order to do business with EU consumers and to sell products into the EU in any case. The sec uh, so third area we're looking at is data protection, and this is because the, um, this is an area of, of um, imminent change. The UK's Data Protection Act uh, prescribes how personal data, and this is data that's held by an organisation from which an individual can be personally identifiable, uh, can be used. And it came into force in 1998. So if you think about the changes in technology and our use of data since that time, you can see why there's been a need for reform and modernisation in this area. So four years of negotiation have resulted in the European General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, and unlike its predecessor, the Data Protection Directive, this is a regulation, meaning that it is automatically and equally enforceable in all member states. There's little room for local variation, and the intention is that the EU will have a single harmonised law. The GDPR makes some very significant changes by enhancing the rights of data subjects, such as giving them the right to have their data uh, transferred from one provider to another uh, or have their data deleted entirely. And it places more onerous obligations on those who process personal data. It also has more significant rights of enforcement, including uh, fines of up to 20 million euros or 4% of company global turnover. The GDPR will automatically come into force uh, on the 25th of May 2018. The compliance requirements of the GDPR can mean enormous changes for many companies in the way that they handle personal data in their organisations. So we're regularly asked if Brexit means that UK companies can down tools on this and avoid GDPR compliance. Well, Brexit is no excuse, it would seem. Firstly, it is unlikely that the UK will have left the EU by May 2018, so it's possible there will be a period of time where the law applies to the UK as a member state. Secondly, the scope of the regulation is significantly broader than the current directive. It will apply, apply to any organisation anywhere in the world if they are processing personal data of EU citizens in connection with offering goods or services, or if they are monitoring EU citizens, such as by way of uh, use of cookies on a website. Accordingly, if the UK wants to do business in the EU, EU, it will need to comply with the GDPR. And finally, the GDPR prohibits the transfer of personal data to a country outside the European economic area, unless the EU has determined that that country's data protection laws are adequate to protect the, data, the personal data of EU citizens. So without a finding of adequacy for the UK, it is much harder and potentially more costly to transfer personal data from the EEA. And this could be for any reasons which might seem quite minor or simple, such as sharing employee data between a parent and subsidiary company across borders, um, or even storing data on servers held outside the EEA. 
The UK's data protection regulator has already come out to say that no matter the form of Brexit, the UK will likely adopt the GDPR wholly or substantially. So UK businesses should start preparing now for its implementation, regardless of Brexit. So we're working with uh, a number of clients now on their GDPR preparation because so much of data usage now goes to the heart of many businesses. We've helped clients create steering committees and identify key roles for data protection compliance. We've designed, designed audits for businesses trying to get a handle on the scope of their data processing activities. And we've devised data protection policies and run training sessions for staff from board level uh, to IT specialists, marketing, and of course, uh, human resources. For many companies, when they start to think about how much personal data they actually handle, May 2018 doesn't actually seem that far away. Finally, I'm going to talk about uh, employment law issues with the caveat that I'm not an employment law specialist. Uh, I've cribbed these notes from a colleague and will do my best to answer any questions. But I think we are all aware that the <clears throat> right to freedom of, freedom of movement of people was a key issue of the referendum debate and is going to remain a central item on the Brexit, uh, amongst the Brexit negotiations. Which means, of course, that planning, staffing and recruitment requirements in this climate uh, is very challenging. Uh, my colleagues <coughs> excuse me, have been advising businesses to take a look at their employees' right to work as it stands at the moment to determine how much, if at all, a business might be affected by any change in the right of those employees to work. Businesses might also want to encourage those staff with the opportunity to do so to take British citizenship or even citizenship of another EU member state so, that, so as to uh, reduce any restrictions, uh, any impact of the restriction of movement in future. Recruitment uh, is another difficult area at the moment. Um, companies could consider changing their recruitment strategies and requirements um, to enable UK companies to have um, wider access to UK-based candidates in the event that their current access to the pool of talent across the EU is restricted. This could be um, reducing requirements for qualifications or certain skills. In the meantime, however, it's business as usual, as we're all reminded. So discriminating job applicants on the basis of their nationality is prohibited. So UK businesses at current cannot disqualify candidates uh, applying now on the basis that their right to work status may potentially change in the future. So in wrapping up, what can we say? Well, we know what we don't know what Brexit actually means yet, and we do know though that it is not quite business as usual, and that this period of uncertainty could uh, last a long while yet. Until we know more, it's very difficult to take any decisive action in preparation for Brexit. But as I've discussed today, there can be a lot you can do when you're preparing for the unknown. Taking stock of assets taking stock of contractual relationships and employee status, preparing for new legislation, such as the data protection regulation, and maintaining influence over both EU and UK legal frameworks are all positive and productive steps that can be, and I know many people in this room are already taking now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alex, uh, for that comprehensive overview of the, the current landscape, albeit uncertain. And just to note that all of you are hopefully not sitting on, but have clutched in your laps the ALPSB's latest briefing on the Brexit. So please uh, take that with you. So we're now going to hop over the increasingly large divide to the EU to talk about what's happening in open science uh, in Brussels. And this is something that has been, on the one hand, uh, coming down the pipeline for a number of years. On the other hand, is quite fluid and evolving rapidly. So I'll just echo the call to action front as I introduce the panel, um, that this is an important time for 
society publishers to be engaged and indeed to the extent you can to be leading your communities in some of these discussions. So what we will do for the next 20 minutes is uh, set the scene for you, uh, just kind of taking a step back, uh, what is getting us to this point in Brussels. Uh, and by this point, I mean the, the second part of our, our presentation, which, which is this latest and greatest open science policy platform um, and what that means so far as we know. And then end with some uh, update on next steps and, and key actions. So I want to share a bit from Wiley's perspective as we have been uh, thinking about uh, open science and uh, indeed all of you are uh, thinking about it and actively engaged. Um, but if we think about the factors that are, are driving this push, um, they are very big picture. They are economic pressure. Um, there is technology and innovation. And along with that and, and related is just the evolution of research practice. And so as we think about the open science policy priorities, um, I think there are uh, a few areas of engagement. One, of course, is just generally open access to publications. And so key questions that we're asking are, with this proliferation of mandates, uh, how do we guide our and serve institutions, authors, and societies? Um, for the transition from policy development to implementation, I think same sort of thing. We're all, in a way, um, feeling our way along. Um, so how can we be a bit more active in uh, providing recommendations and and learning and building use cases and across every research stakeholder. For open science more broadly, and I, I guess I should have started by saying, well, what is open science? Um, that too may vary depending on who you ask. Uh, we would say it is the opening up of the outputs of research. Um, so publication is, is one output, data is another output. Um, Robert mentioned code, that is also another output. and. We are now moving from what was just a discussion about open science to, to this broader uh, discussion. And I don't think that is um, something that's going away. It is a given of the future and something we all need to be dealing with. So I think the questions are, how do we engage and how do we lead this conversation together with the rest of the community? And underlying this um, is sort of the third issue, that's copyright reform and enforcement. Um, what tools and services do we develop if there are changes in, in text and data mining regulation? And how do we deal with the sci-hubs of the world? There's our increasing global threats. Um, I don't have all the answers for you, but I think this is just a, a, a good look at the issues that are underlying open science. And so a key question that all of us have to think about in this period of flux is, or you know, what are the fundamental guiding principles of your organization or your discipline community? Uh, this is, again, from the Wiley perspective. You know, our, our, our focus has been on investing in open science technology, experimenting, learning, evolving, and innovating. I think that's all we can be doing. I think the bottom line is it's about engagement, um, engaging across your community. And for us, that means across with many partners across uh, many disciplines. And so the stakeholders or sorry, the, the principles are fairly straightforward. Um, sustainable open access and open science means that these policies are aligned with the needs of disciplined communities um, and have flexibility across those different needs that we aren't imposing new burdens necessarily on institutions and on researchers, and that we do this all in the spirit of public and private collaboration, um, leveraging the innovations that publishers, for example, are making and that government is making um, and, and working together. So I say this as we enter uh, a new phase in Brussels. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of these regulations. I think the 
EU has been talking about open access and, and open science for years and in different forms. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Brussels, it can be a pretty confusing place. There are recommendations, and then there are communications, and then there are principles, and there are proposals, and all of these documents tend to get leaked beforehand, and you're not sure what is what. So let me just draw your attention to um, maybe these bottom two. May 2016, um, actually, let me draw your attention to three things. 2013, Horizon 2020, which is sort of the eighth framework program on research funding and the agenda, so that's 2014 to 2020. There, there was a very clear call uh, for open access to publications, um, a green uh, road, open access of six and 12 month embargoes, uh, and, uh, but also support for gold open access, uh, and also calling for the importance of open data and the launching of some pilots in that area. I think in May 2015, and as Alex mentioned, um, the EU launched their digital single market strategy to become an innovation union. And uh, copyright and open access um, are uh, touched on in, in that very high level way. And it continues to be a major priority uh, for Brussels moving forward. And so we've seen that most specifically in May 2016 when the Competitiveness Council issued uh, these conclusions on the transitions to an open access system or open science system. And uh, perhaps in shorthand, it is known as the OA 2020 document because that um, perhaps was one of the most uh, fundamental positions it took that the EU and member states should be transitioning to a full OA system by 2020. Uh, I should mention that that was not a binding document, it was in a way aspirational. And that's why here, this bottom piece, the Open Science Policy Platform, which actually kicks off next Monday, is very important. It is going to become the mechanism to facilitate um, the discussions about how we follow up on this com these Competitiveness Council recommendations. So, Let's dig into the OSPP. We might as well get used to some new acronyms. The mission overall um, is pretty ambitious. You know, you've probably seen, and if you're on a Lib license or an Open Science Initiative listserv, the number of different communities and stakeholders that are talking and thinking about and experimenting with uh, open science. So I, I think the OSPP uh, process or, or uh, structure and goals are interesting because it is a, an effort to bring together in a somewhat coordinated way all these communities. And um, let's hope uh, they do it with more success than maybe uh, we've been able to achieve so far. And essentially this OSPP uh, process is designed to advise the commission about policy recommendations and really leading into implementation of uh, open science related goals which we're going to dig into. And it is meant to be also the umbrella for stakeholder consultation um, and addressing issues that are faced by uh, libraries, by publishers, by funders, so on and so forth. And also to address um, cross-cutting issues since these all tend to be related. So what is the scope of the OSPP in terms of its agenda? There are uh, five sort of policy action areas. The first is around incentives, so fostering and creating incentives for open science. The second is around legal and other barriers, so removing them uh, from the way of open science, so uh, from researcher career incentives to uh, legal constraints, and I think in, in Brussels that often has some relation to copyright. To proliferate OA policies um, and mainstream them uh, so that there is clear recognition among member states about the, their importance, uh, both in terms of open access to publication and open data. To help implement these policies to develop infrastructure, in particular for open data. 
um, that will support this. And, and we'll talk a bit more about the notion of a European open science cloud, which is uh, the focus of the infrastructure. And fifth, um, I'd call it social orientation. That is embedding open science in society as a socioeconomic driver. Um, that this is all going towards solving those grand challenges that um, the research community is focused on. So that's the agenda at a very high level. That's, as I said, it's ambitious. And they have then broken it out into eight work streams, uh, which we'll dig into in more detail. Um, the first is around open data. And uh, Robert mentioned FAIR, findable, accessible, um, interoperable, reusable. The second is, as I mentioned, the infrastructure, European Open Science Cloud. The third, altmetrics, um, not the specific uh, organization, but just essentially alternative metrics for research impact. And for all of us, that means um, moving beyond impact factors in particular. Fourth, uh, new business models for scholarly communication, AKA publishing. Fifth, rewards, uh, rewards uh, in, for the system of research and for academic recognition. Six, researcher integrity. Seven, sort of open science skills, the training and, and education you need to underpin all of this. And, and eighth, um, that socioeconomic orientation is about citizen science. Are you tired yet? I think that's, this is just the start, really. And there is a process by which this is going to be managed, and it's still evolving, but essentially there should be we expect three different mechanisms. One is digital, that there will be online consultations, which anybody, um, any organization should be able to contribute to. Perha but perhaps um, two and three, the working group and steering group process, that is what is uh, most well understood at the moment, um, that there will be working groups for each of the eight areas and they will feed into a steering group of 20 diverse organizations that will uh, feed back into communities, try to build consensus, and then bring back guidance and recommendations to the commission. And I should mention for 2016, uh, the idea is, as we're hurtling into 2017, um, that They'll first focus on four of the eight areas, and those are the alternative metrics, uh, the scholarly publishing models, the rewards for scientists, and the uh, European Open Science Cloud. So I apologize, this is very small, and it is available online, but these are the members of the steering committee. So you can see that they stretch from universities to science academies, research funders, um, citizen science, publishers, thankfully, uh, open science platforms, and, and of course, libraries. And I should mention from the publisher's perspective, um, Michael Mabe, who is the head of the International Association of Scientific, Technical, and Medical Publishers, is one of the steering committee members, um, as is the head of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, OASPA. I forgot to mention, of course, um, that academic and learned societies are a well-represented constituency um, from chemical to uh, young researcher organizations. Uh, and uh, EMBO is a European Molecular Biology Organization also on the list. So I think digging into detail about um, each of the eight work streams, and the commission has been clear that there is a policy ambition that they want everybody to work towards. So if you look towards the right for uh, fair data, what is success? Fair data sharing is the default for funding scientific research. So you know. You, again, Robert was talking about this earlier, and um, there are a number of, of challenges around open data, and, and so I think OSPP is thinking about what it can do to facilitate a good governance model for 
consensus building and, and uh, setting incentives. Um, we all know uh, data means many different things if you're talking, depending on who you're talking to. For uh, an astronomer, it means terabytes and terabytes of, of data. For um, social science, maybe it's a smaller data set. It, everything uh, in between. Um, so what can the process do in terms of setting that consensus building process so we can establish some standards. The second is for the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, the ambition is that all researchers should be able to deposit, access, and analyze European scientific data through this European Science Cloud without leaving their desk. Now, I think when um, we were first hearing about this, this was a was somewhat alarming. Um, did we really need another giant central data repository, especially when communities have such well-established uh, data repositories of their own? I think uh, Brussels has clarified their uh, ambition and that it, the idea is to create um, infrastructure that enables the sharing and enables the interoperability. Um, and so essentially a federated system. And certainly from Wiley's perspective, we think this makes uh, a lot of sense. We don't want to duplicate and impose new burden. What's most important is that these systems and, and infrastructure are talking to each other. Third, around alternative metrics. The ambition is that funders and stakeholders have taken a common position on alternative metrics to replace or complement the journal impact factor and citation counts. Uh, obviously, this is a, um, a concern in many ways, um, but this is a discussion that has also been ongoing for a number of years. And it, uh, time will tell whether the commission and through this OSPP process, um, how much progress is actually made in this area. Four, scholarly publishing business models. Ambition, all peer-reviewed scientific publications are freely accessible, AKA new business models for scholarly communication. You know, I think when the Competitiveness Council uh, document came out, there were concerns from many sides about a full transition to open access by 2020. We all know that different funders uh, have different um, priorities, also different ways that they are receiving funding. There are issues of university funding and just budgets overall. It's quite a complex picture. I would say that it seems um, the, the scope of this exercise is to identify new business models that have proven to be viable. That is sort of stated in the uh, guiding document so far. So I, I think it's an important question to say, well, what does viable mean? Um, what, is, what is the evidence base for doing that? Five, uh, for rewards. Evaluation of research careers fully acknowledges open science activities. Um, I think this is pretty clear. Most researchers are supportive of open science on an individual uh, or overall, but on an indi individual basis when you're stretched for time, uh, focused on getting funding, uh, they may be reluctant to engage um, because if they aren't rewarded for it. So what do we need to do um, to incentivize and change behavior and codes of conduct? Sorry. Six, seven, and eight are a bit more straightforward, so I won't spend much time on them, but um, for research integrity, all publicly funded research in the EU adheres to commonly agreed open science standards of research integrity. Seven, uh, around open science skills, all open research, all researchers in Europe have the necessary open science skills and to support and apply open science research routines and practices. And this, the idea is they would design a skill modules for researchers early on in their career, which they call R1, or doctoral candidates, onto R4, who would be leading researchers. And finally, for citizen science, citizen scientists will make a significant contribution and be recognized as a valid producer of open science. So this is allowing the non-institutionalized scientific actors and citizens to participate more in mainstream science activities. 
So I'm calling these opportunities and challenges and not threats. Um, you know, I, highlighting the ones in, in green as areas in particular for society publishers and uh, publishers in general to be paying attention. These are potentially transformative, uh, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in ways we're less certain about. Um, fair data uh, in particular, um, you know, you who are more discipline specific better understand the needs of your community. So you really, that is a, a, a means that societies need to be vocal or to understand um, what their particular uh, views are on things such as what is good data and what, again, how long do we hold on to data? The, uh, I'm, we can ask Robert after this, who's probably a, the real expert, um, the list of questions that we would need to address. The European, European Open Science Cloud, um, again, the idea of if, that our infrastructure speaks to each other. We just need to be uh, engaged to know what infrastructure we want to support and need to support. The third area around alternative metrics, um, I think the, the, I don't need to say much about why uh, the movement away from citation and impact factor um, is concerning. We, we, we haven't found yet another uh, valid metric, and certainly um, the way our business is structured um, and how we are all engaged in academic rewards, it's all very tied together. Um, and four, of course, uh, the changing publisher business models, and in particular, what is going to be an evidence base to make a recommendation um, at the commission level. There are some additional factors to be considered that will change the calculus of how things move. Um, first is maybe the orientation of the commission. Uh, certainly the, the Directorate General of Research is uh, managing the OSPP process. I would say that uh, they have not necessarily been particularly inclined to support or listen to publishers. Um, this does mean that societies may play a more important role um, because you do have a, a, a direct line into your communities. You are you're representing the publishing interests, but you're also representing um, your discipline. Another factor is, of course, the, the, the diluted voice of the UK um, as this moves forward. And, um, well, as Alex said, we'll see exactly uh, how that unfolds. But that may mean more engagement for all of us, not only in the UK in, in ensuring that they do maintain a strong voice, but also in Brussels. Uh, I think a mitigating factor is that um, while certain parts of the EU, in particular the Netherlands, and some members of the Commission itself are very um, wanting to move very quickly, um, there are concerns from a number of other member states who have, uh, again, as I mentioned, different funding me mechanisms, different budget requirements, different um, university systems, and what will that mean um, for reaching consensus? So just to close, um, what are the broader implications that OSPP is a one of these standard, somewhat bureaucratic policy mechanisms, but it has significant implications. It will shape the future of the next EU funding program, FP9, so the next Horizon 2020. Will there be new requirements on uh, grant recipients um, across every area? It also means that member states will need to follow up on whatever uh, policy recommendations come out from this OSPP process. We are seeing now, for example, Sweden, Norway, and France, who are, are, have a number of open access legislation, um, the same process would unfold, too, uh, after OSPP concludes. And finally, global. Um, funders are actively engaged in discussion worldwide. I was just in uh, Japan and in China, and we they were talking about the Competitiveness Council conclusions and saying, well, what do you think that means? 
is everybody going to be gold uh, by 2020? What would that require in my country uh, to make that change? So I think the, the bottom line um, throughout, and I think for our whole panel, is uh, what can you do? It's about engaging, and to the extent you can, leading. I think the follow-up there is to take stock of your communities. Um, how are you contributing so far? How do you want to contribute? What, what are the key concerns in some of these areas? And second, um, and why I guess all of you are here, it's about being present and leveraging the resources that you have to, to be a voice in the UK and in Brussels. So ALPSP certainly, um, and there are other trade associations like STM who can help. Um, you know, Wiley is organizing for our own partners uh, uh, meetings in Dornox, both here and in Brussels, just to make sure that uh, societies uh, have a voice. So um, I th we'll leave you there, and we're going to transition to for the last segment of, of questions. So I know those of you who have been writing feverishly have some uh, things for Robert and Alex and myself. So we'll uh, be taking them over there. And I'll, I'll kick us off first with a few questions. So I think first I thought we could start with Robert. Um, well, I'd like to say from Wiley's perspective, we're very supportive of the new APC guidelines and um, really appreciated the consultation that we were able to engage with uh, in, with you. And, and actually, it was a good chance to look at our own compliance process and find ways to improve things. Uh, you know, my own role is, is global. Um, so I am curious from your perspective and from Welcome Trust as an organization, do you see the uh, requirements and best practices you are in, uh, promoting in the community as something that should be a model for other funders worldwide? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the, the, the short answer to that would just be yes. Um, <laughs> Obviously, I should make it absolutely clear that these requirements do only kick in if um, sort of money changes hands. So, if, if a, a particular funder is more uh, supportive of the green model, and that's how research is made available, then our requ these requirements would wouldn't comply. So, again, for our, our researchers, if if a, an APC doesn't get paid, all those requirements um, uh, that don't kick in. But we would certainly encourage other, other funders which do support our sort of approach to endorse that. And we, we obviously work in the UK with something called the Charity Open Access Fund, which is a, a, a consortium of research funders in the charity sector, so Wellcome, CIUK, British Heart Foundation and others. And we are looking really to establish that as the standard uh, model across all COF-funded research. Great. Um, let me turn it over to Alex. We discussed a little bit, and you mentioned in your presentation, the impact on Horizon 2020, but clearly the research projects that many of our communities are engaged in, um, both going both ways, could be affected by Brexit. Um, so could you uh, elaborate maybe on um, advice uh, for, for those concerned with those issues? Yes. it's a really tricky one this because at the moment nothing changes and the reason that's tricky in terms of people who might be applying for um, grants or more particularly applying for positions that might be related to Horizon 2020 grants is that employment and discrimination laws will of course still apply um, to the extent they already do within that context so um, for example um, uh, at, at the moment, um, anyone in the UK can participate uh, if invited to do so or lead the initiative on, on the Horizon 2020 uh, application. Um, t if, if someone were to um, hire someone on the basis of that uh, being a key component of their role and then decide that uh, a UK national would not be eligible for that role in case in future 
uh, they lose the the uh, or the UK's uh, support for that initiative falls away. That's potentially a discrimination issue under employment law, which puts I imagine puts researchers in a very difficult position when they are compiling applications now for things that they want to do in the future in this sort of uncertain landscape. They still have to comply with the existing laws. Great, thank you. Let me uh, open it up to the audience for questions. There's a, um, Svia has a mic in the back if you want to raise something. Thank you, Rob Johnson of Research Consulting. I, I thought it was a tremendously helpful session from all the speakers, so, so thank you very much for that. Um, it's perhaps a question for you actually, Andrew, rather similar to the one you posed to, to Robert, but um, I thought it was a really helpful overview of what's happening in Europe. Um, how do you see that as sitting alongside developments globally, and to what extent do you see there being alignment between Europe, the US, China, other, other parts of the world? That's a good question. The short answer is I'm not sure. Well, you know, Europe is uh, more supportive of gold as a whole than you might see, certainly in China and the US. Um, so, and an, as we all know, the, this notion of a full transition by 2020 uh, across the entire EU is very complicated due to, again, uh, differences on a variety of factors across member states. Um, I think potentially uh, that on the open access to publication side of things, we may not see a significant impact, just again because of these uh, country level differences. The US, I won't put money on it, but is not going to move away from green open access anytime soon. China, um, we know just how costly it would be for them to transition to an entirely gold system um, and the, a number of political factors that would prevent that from happening uh, very quickly. So m the, the larger value um, and influence uh, the OSPP process could have, I think, is in, in uh, open data. Um, to the extent it's, it's a successful, this consultation, and able to, to achieve consensus. It is, I would say, the, lar the first government coordinated and across all member states uh, level uh, type of consulting mechanism. So I think open data, very concretely, some things could happen. Um, the things like uh, academic rewards and alternative metrics, I'm, I'm less uh, optimistic about. I think there was a question in the third. Yeah. Hi, um, Jess Monaghan, Spray, Na Spray Nature. I had a question for Robert. Um, obviously, the publisher requirements that you said intended to be a kind of COF um, sort of initiative. I was wondering whether there are any particular barriers or concerns as to why not all of the COF charities have decided to implement it to date. I think it, um, <clears throat> so I think they will. Um, it's been very, very difficult on a practical level for an institution to manage the COF funds if. Welcome requires this and uh, Parkinson's UK doesn't. Um, it was simply, uh, I think, at the timing that many of those smaller charities didn't have the, um, weren't able to turn around things perhaps quickly enough. So I think we will see uh, convergence on that. It's difficult to see how COVE could, could not work as a single set of requirements. Uh. Yes, two questions from the back. And Hi, I'm Malavika from uh, the publishing arm of the Biochemical Society. Uh, I had a question, I think mostly for, for Robert. Um, when I read the requirements as they were released on the day that they were released, uh, the publisher requirements, the word immediate was used with regards to the PMC deposit for gold open access. And um, while, it's, while that's fully acceptable that you know, it needs to happen as the version of record is 
published, as those requirements call out the word immediate so specifically, I wanted to check the mechanics of that. Does that mean within 24 hours? Does that mean within 15 minutes? You know, or, at, at, at the mechanical level, what does that look like? <clears throat> right, so um, I think I don't have them in front of me. I think it says immediate on issue publication. So we're talking about when the, when the thing is published. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, let me assure you, we have not got the time, the inclination, or the mechanism <laughs> um, to do that. It's an aspiration. We have not set that 10 minutes, 10 days. We haven't done that. We, we just expect publishers to, as it's published, we're assuming that a lot of these workflows are pretty automated. We're not humans having to think, oh, I must post it, PNC. So as you publish, uh, you post. That would be the aspiration. So I don't know if it's 10 minutes or 10 days at the time of publication. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. And, um, I, and, and I'm sorry, let me also say is we, we really don't want to position. Uh, we're not trying to blacklist publishers. We want to ensure that our researchers can publish in the journals where they want to publish. So if a journal, if a publisher is committing, you know, in the spirit and the ambition to meet our requirements, and 100 articles meet, the, or 99 articles meet the requirement and one doesn't, we're not going to blacklist that publisher. That is not in our interest or our researchers' interest. So they are, they are requirements, but we're trying to work with the community to say, when we pay an APC, we expect you to honour these set of conditions. Thank you. Um, I did have a second question, if I may. We, I'd suggest maybe you continue the conversation after we have time for one more, and I know there was a, a hand in the back. Hi, uh, I'm Ed Pence from Crossref. Uh, another question uh, for you, Robert, just on welcome open research. Uh, two questions, are, are there any connections or relationships with between Welcome Open Research and, and eLife and uh, could open wel Welcome Open Research, uh, do, is it uh, possibly a platform for, for preprints as well as other things? Uh, thank, thanks, Ed. Um, there's no formal uh, relationship at all at the moment between, between, the, between eLife and, and Welcome Open Research other than with that we are, we are we're funding them. Um, they are effectively, you know, two separate platforms, publishers, you know, journals, if you like. Um, there may be a mechanism whereby, in the future, we work with, um, could consider working with publishers, including eLife, if they want to. The papers go there and they don't get uh, published. They could consider being, if they're welcome funded, could consider being submitted to uh, Welcome Open Research. Uh, preprints. I think that the key difference between Welcome Open Research and a preprint, I suppose fundamentally, is that once you decide to publish on Welcome Open Research and it passes the, 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 the technical, ethical, or, or those hygiene checks, then it gets published. You cannot downstream think, actually, you know what, I think I should get, try and get this in nature. So once you publish on Welcome Open Research, that is it, that is where you, you, you publish. Um, so we seem slightly different. That's why we're actively working with um, Asset Bio to see if we can develop that type of mechanism as well. Great. So um, I've already failed in my instructions from Audrey. But just to, to close, uh, just a reminder that the uh, member AGM is happening in Discovery 2 and 3 in the other room. And I think we will um, be around for at least a little bit if you guys have follow-up questions. please. Join me in, in thanking our panelists today.